Good morning, Lighthouse. Uh, so good to have all of you join us for worship this Sunday morning. Uh, let's just take some time to prepare our hearts as we dive into this time of worship, celebrating and giving thanks to our God.
my anthem Lord, when the world has fallen quiet You stand beside me Give me a song in the night Jesus, I need you every moment. I need you here now. This grace, but what sing out your praise forever? It's a beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes You find the weak and contrite heart You shoulder its burdens Carry it into the light Jesus, I need Every moment I need you here now. This grace, but what sing out your praise forever? Sing that again, Jesus. Jesus, I need you every moment. Behind me, your loving kindness has never failed me. Christ before me, Christ behind me. Remember love, remember mercy. Christ before me, Christ behind me, your loving kindness has never failed me. Christ before me, Christ behind me. Jesus, I need you every moment.
spoke a word You were singing over me You have been so, so good to me For I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me Don't be overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God Down fight still I'm found leaves a ninety-nine I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it still you give yourself away Oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God Yeah I was your foe, I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. And I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me To the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God, yeah shadow there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down why you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down coming after me Oh, the overwhelming never-ending reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down Fight still I'm found Please the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God
Hello, Lighthouse family and our guests, and welcome to our Sunday service. I'm so glad that you have joined us today, whether you are joining during our 10 o'clock uh, Sunday morning corporate worship or you are joining us at a later time uh, on your own. Now, this week we are starting a brand new series called Living a Life of No Regrets. And I'm sure many, if not all of you, have heard the expression YOLO, right? Uh, for those of you who Never heard that term, which I'm kind of troubled by the fact that you have never heard this term. Uh, but anyways, YOLO is an acronym that stands for You Only Live Once. Even though that expression YOLO is a relatively new term, or I guess the, that, that the term has been coined uh, in recent past, the truth of YOLO has always been with us ever since the beginning of our time. There are many things that we, re we, we get to repeat or redo in life. But living our life here on earth is not one of them. Regardless of our wealth or health or age or education and so on, we all have just one life and one life only. And we get to live only once here on earth. So the question is, how can we make our life, that one life that we all have, right? How can we make this one life count here on earth? To put it another way, how can we live a life of no regrets? As we look back that one day when, when it comes, and we, if we are aware enough and if we are fortunate enough to be still awake and have a moment to be able to look back, right, uh, to our past, like how do we live our life in such a way that it will be a life of no regret, but instead it will be a full of joy? And according to the Bible, according to God's word, the key to life, or living a life of no regrets, is this thing called stewardship. And that's what we're going to focus on uh, for, the, for the remainder of uh, the series, starting with today. But today, as we start, our, our, start out our series on stewardship, we will define what stewardship is, right? We need to have the right, def uh, right working definition of what stewardship is. And then we will also uh, look at why stewardship is the key to living a life of no regrets. By looking at um, one of what, what I would refer to as a YOLO stories uh, told by Jesus. Okay, it just sounds funny, right, to put YOLO and Jesus in the same sentence. It almost seems wrong. <laughs> But we will see uh, in this YOLO story that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30, as to why stewardship is really the key to living a life of no regrets. But before we get into God's word, uh, let's first pray for our time in God's word. God, we thank you for the gift of your word through which you reveal the truth about you and about us. Holy Spirit, use our time in your word today to convict, encourage, renew, heal, and transform our minds and our hearts. It is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, probably many of you are familiar, already familiar with the story uh, that we are going to look at today, uh, found in Matthew chapter 25. Verses, verses 14 through 30, which is often referred to as the parable of talents. Parable meaning simply story, right, that Jesus told to illustrate a certain point. So the parable of talents. And if you are familiar with this story, instead of checking out, thinking like, oh, I already, I already have heard this story many, many times growing up in the church, I want to just in encourage you and invite you to uh, engage, stay engaged in this story, that we're going to look at to, uh, today, not for the first time for many of you, if you are already familiar with the story, but instead, instead of checking out or instead of assuming that you already know or have heard uh, everything that there is to be told uh, or, or to be learned from this story that Jesus tells, I want, to, I want to invite you to engage in the story by putting yourself in to the character uh, in the story that Jesus tells by asking this question, like, who, who can I most identify with in the story? So first, let's begin by defining what stewardship is uh, by looking at Jesus' story. And here's how the story begins in verses 14 uh, of Matthew chapter 25. I'm just going to read the first two verses. Okay, so here. It says, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. 
to each according to his ability. Then he, meaning the master, went away. So let me just stop right there and, and define what stewardship is. And I like uh, how, I mean, there are many ways of defining what stewardship is, looking at the scripture. But I like how David, Dave Ramsey uh, defines his definition or his way of summarizing what, what stewardship is. And here's how he defines stewardship. Stewardship is managing God's blessings, God's way, for God's glory. Let me just repeat that one more time for those of you who are taking notes. Stewardship is managing God's blessings, God's way, for God's glory. Or another word is God's purpose. And at the start of his story, Jesus reminds us of one of the most important truths uh, about our life that we often forget, which is this. God, God owns and we manage. God owns and we, you and I, manage. Okay? And, and here is what David says, the King David, that is, uh, of the Old Testament, uh, says about God and, and, and why, 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 why we are the manager, not owner. In Psalm chapter 24, verse 1, here's what King David says. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. In other words, God is the owner of everything, right? Including those who live in the world or on earth. That means you and me. Again, God owns and we, you and I, manage everything that has been given to us. Now, if you're a Christian, you might be tempted to say, like, I already know and believe this. Why are we talking about this? Let's just get on to how, right? But, but, but let's just pause and be honest and just ask ourselves, is that really true? Do you really believe this? Do I really believe this and live this truth out in my day-to-day life? Do I use my time, my talent, my money as if God is the owner and I'm the manager of all that has been entrusted to me? You know, do I ask God what he thinks about how or how much or where I spend my time, my talent, and my money each day as I plan for the future or as I make decisions on a day-to-day basis in different aspects of my life? Or do I make my own decisions about how, where, or how much I spend my time, talent, and treasure, that is our finance, right? As if I am the owner rather than I am the manager of what God has entrusted to me. And I think that is a real test rather than just what do you confess to believe, but like what, what, what is shown in my life, in my day-to-day life, Is it evident that God is the owner and I'm the manager of all that God has entrusted to me? And as Jesus tells this story uh, about stewardship, right, he he just, again, begins by saying, hey, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property, right, the master's property. It's not like he's, he's giving it to them for them uh, to now become. He's not transferring the ownership, in other words. But he's entrusting his property to them until later on when he would come back and, and collect, right? Receive the return. Now, before we get to the why of stewardship, I want to point out a few important truths that Jesus tells us about God, uh, who is the giver of all good things, and how God entrusts his blessings to each of us. And the first thing that I want to point out is the generosity of God toward all of us. Generosity of God toward all of us, which it, for us is not very evident. It's not very, it doesn't stand out to us that God is generous in, 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 in Jesus' story. But the fact that Jesus chose this uh, unit of weight called talent, okay, which is the largest uh, unit, uh, uh, unit of weight for measuring uh, 
precious, precious metals like gold. Okay? And, and one talent, it sounds like so little, right? But one talent of gold is 34 kilograms or 75 pounds of gold. That's like a bag full of gold, okay? Or, or I guess the more loose translation would be like boatload of cash. Right? So what, what is Jesus telling us about God? Jesus is telling us that God is generous to all. He gives generously to all, right? It just, so you don't have to really get technical here. Uh, even if you're not mathematically inclined, you don't have to, you know, get lost in the details of how much was that equivalent of two days, you know, wage, like how many years. Just know that Jesus is simply telling his audience or he was telling his audience and he's reminding us today that God has given each of us generously more than enough and certainly more than we ever deserve. And then second the thing that Jesus tells us through this parable is this about God is God is why like, is, is about the wisdom of God and entrusting different measure a different amount of uh, of talent right blessing based on what it says according to their ability how is that a blessing how, how does that show God's wisdom right just think about it right us being given more than we can manage we have the ability to manage. That is not a blessing. That is a burden. Right? When you're given more than you can handle, you can manage, is that a blessing? No. <laughs> it's a burden. Just think about your stomach, right? Eating, I mean, we, we love getting our stomach full. Or at least I do. Just Let me just kind of focus on myself, right? I, I love uh, that sensation of feeling full, but when I eat too much, it's no longer pleasant, Right? And what, what if, if I were to just continue to stuff my stomach with more and more food, even though, I mean, beyond, well beyond the point of feeling satiated or feeling satisfied? It's not going to be good for my stomach. I'm not going to feel great. After a while, after a certain point, it's going right, to cause all kinds of problems. It's burdensome, it's not a blessing. And God, in his wisdom and in his kindness, knew each one of us intimately. He knew how much blessing to entrust to us so that we can manage that blessing according to our, our ability, right? According to our ability. So, you know, so, so that means God will not ask us one day when we see God, when we stand before God. Is not, God is not going to ask us, hey, how come you didn't accomplish more for my cause, for my, my purpose, uh, compared to like Robbie and men and, you know, others, these, these phenomenal Christians, right? Hey, man, KJ, what, what were you doing? Like, how come you, you didn't accomplish more for my purpose like these so-and-so? God is not going to do that. God is going to ask us. God is going to evaluate our life based on what he has entrusted to us, knowing our ability to manage, right? Our, our load, in other words. He knew how much load we could handle, we could take. And so God's just going to, God is not going to compare us to others, but he's going to evaluate our, our life based on how we have managed what God has given to us. Just think about that, how freeing that is. But that's not how the world evaluate us. Or, or how even, if we were to be honest, evaluate one another, right? We evaluate one another by what? By comparing ourselves to others. Or by comparing them to us or us to them. Or sometimes we evaluate others, right? The third parties. By, evalu by, by comparing them to each other. By their accomplishments, by their wealth, by their education, by their looks, whatever it is. But God, our creator and the giver, who, the generous giver of all things that we have, right, will not evaluate us through comparison, but by simply, right, on the basis of what he has given us and what we have done with what he has given us. Okay, so what is stewardship? Stewardship is what? Stewardship is managing God's blessing, okay? God's blessing, God's way for God's glory, or in other, in other words, uh, God's purpose. 
Now let's continue with the rest of Jesus' story uh, in this parable, starting in verse 16, to see why stewardship is the key to living a life of no regret. Why stewardship is the key to living a life of no regret. Let me pick up in verse 16 in our passage, and then we're going to go all the way to the end, and then we'll come back. Okay? And it says, he who had received the five talents went at once, right, immediately, went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So basically he doubled. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. Same thing, right, doubled. And what is assumed here is went immediately as well. And verse 18, but he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. In other words, he didn't do anything with it. Okay? And then verse 19, now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And here Jesus is alluding to our lifetime, at the end of our life, right? It's not like Jesus is coming tomorrow. I mean, he could. He could. But assuming that we live our long, full life, right? It's, it's, it seems like a long time to us. So he says in verse 19, At, After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled account with them. In verse 20, and he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. Right? I've doubled what you have given me. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. Which is amazing that, right, and, and, and that, that, the, the master will call a talent. Again, that's a lot of money, boatload of cash, and refer to that as little. And that really shows how generous God is as a giver of good things. But anyways, let me continue on. He says, you have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And then verse 22 and he also, who had two, the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. I've doubled what you've given me. In verse 23, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And then verse 24. Now is, there's a twist. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, meaning harsh, right? Hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. He just gives the original amount, right, what was given to him completely unused for master's purpose. In verse 26, but his master answered him, you wicked and slothful or lazy servant, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I had, ha, have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Here, by the way, it's, it's a sarcasm. Jesus is not, you know, describing God as being harsh reaping where God had not sown. But instead, Jesus is saying, okay, let's just kind of go along with your logic. You really thought, you really believe that your master is a harsh master, right, who expects return from where the master has not sown. And then verse 27, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. In other words, if you really thought that I was harsh, expecting a return where I have not invested, then at the least you should have put my money with a banker so that I would have had, just like you were saying, that I am, right? I would have received interest along with my original money. And then verse 28, it gets darker. And it says, take, and so take the talent from him the one with the one talent who dug the ground and hid 
the master's money, and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will be more, will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here's why stewardship is key to living a life of no regrets. And just for, for, for a moment, let me just kind of take us all the way back to the beginning where, where the Bible starts, right? According to the Bible, we were created for worship. To be more specific, we were created to worship God, our maker and our lover. And because we are created for worship, we will experience, therefore, the greatest joy and fulfillment in life whether in this life here on earth or or life in eternity, right? We will therefore experience the greatest joy and fulfillment in life when we worship God. Are you following me? Because we are created for worship, to worship God. Therefore, we will experience the greatest joy and sense of fulfillment when we worship God. Now, you might ask, like, how do we worship God? What do you mean by worship? Isn't what we're doing every Sunday when we're tuning in to a 10 o'clock worship service and, and seeing those praises, isn't, isn't that worship? Isn't that what we're doing here? Absolutely. And there's something special that God does in, in, in our gather corporate worship. But worship is so much more than uh, one hour or, or, or two hours that we spend each week or once a week when we gather here. Together. According to the Bible, we worship God the loudest through our stewardship. We worship God, our maker and our lover, the loudest through our stewardship. And here's what I mean by that. As we are told in the, again, the first book of the Bible, which is Genesis, after God created humanity in, his, in, in God's own image, it says God placed humanity on earth the one that he created, the, the one that God created and said it was good, right? And then God created humanity in God's image and told humanity to manage all that God had created. Why? To make it flourish. It says so that they will go and multiply, right? And fill the earth to flourish, That was always God's design and desire for his creation, including humanity. And now what do we call managing God's blessing, God's way for God's purpose? Stewardship, right? Stewardship. So, again, we are created to worship God, and we worship God the loudest through our stewardship. And that's why stewardship is the key to living a life of no regrets. You know, through this a story of three uh, servants uh, that we read today, Jesus reminds us that not only are we created for stewardship, which is really a worship, right? A form of worship. Not only did God create us for stewardship, but the day of accounting is coming for all of us. Right? And that is true. Even if, let's say, you're tuning in today uh, for, our, for our corporate worship on Sunday, and, and you're not a follower of Christ. You don't believe that God exists, but that doesn't change the fact that God exists. You might say, hey, I own everything. I work hard for this. I deserve this. I, I'm entitled to own my stuff. Right? But that still doesn't change the fact that God owns and you manage. It's like, let, let, let's say I invited one of you to my house to stay over for your vacation or whatnot. You know, like first day you're very grateful. Second day you kind of get used to, and then you get really comfortable by the end of that week. And then now you're like coming into my master bedroom and going through my, you know, drawers. And now you're putting on my wonderful wardrobe, like impressive collection of wardrobe in my closet, right? And then I ask you, like, I, hey, 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 friend, like, hey, brother, like, I'm glad that you're feeling very comfortable here, but I think you're getting a little too comfortable. And then the brother turns around and says, what do you mean? This is my stuff. This is my place. 
What do you call that person? Crazy. <laughs> right? Yet that's exactly what many of us do to God in our relationship with God. We, we instead of letting God be the owner and us gratefully and joyfully managing all that God has entrusted to us, we sometimes act as though this is my place, right? That I am the owner. But anyway, so here in this story, Jesus not only reminds us that we are a created for stewardship by God, but that the day of accounting is coming for all of us. And, the day, and, that, and that day is coming when each of us will stand before Jesus, our Lord, the Master, to give an account for how we have stewarded his blessing. And though we don't get to choose when that day will come for us, we don't, right? We don't know when we will face the Lord. But we do get to choose how that day will turn out, how that day will go for us. You see, that day will be the day of great rejoicing and great rewards for everyone who has stewarded God's blessing, God's way, for God's glory. Like the first two servants who went out immediately and did something with what God, right, the master had given them, entrusted to them, right, in line with master's purpose. But the day will be the day of irreversible regret and loss for those who squandered God's blessing by spending it all on themselves or on things that have nothing to do with God's glory or God's purpose. It's quite sobering, isn't it? Now, now, now in case some of you are still kind of stuck in that disturbing description of the outcome of the third servant with the one talent, the one that who hid his money or, or, or the master's money right on the ground and just simply just gave it back and say, hey, just take it and leave it. The servant Right here, it says just to refresh your memory. It says that that servant, right, will, will not only be kicked out of the presence of the master, but whatever he had will be taken away, and he will be kicked out into this place of darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now you might you might be asking yourself, does does that mean that if if I don't store God's blessing in my life, that I will end up in hell? Is that what it's talking about? Or, or do we earn God's acceptance and our salvation by our, our work of stewardship? The short answer is no. Bible, throughout the Bible, it is absolutely crystal clear that we are accepted by God and we can only be saved, uh, saved by God through his grace, not through our work including our work of faithful stewardship, which is part of our worship unto God, right? We are not saved by our work, including our stewardship. We're saved by His grace, what, what God has done in Christ through His life, right? a perfect obedience, His death for, for, to, to make a payment for our sins, and through the power of His resurrection that, that frees us from not only the penalty, but the power of sin, upon our lives and eventually and ultimately the presence of sin in our life in, in the days to come, right? So it is by grace through our faith in Jesus Christ and his work on our behalf that we are saved. We are accepted by God. But before you take a sigh of relief and say, man, I'm so glad to hear that. Now I can go back to how I was living my life before I heard this message. Uh, before you take a sigh of relief too quickly, here's what I want to remind all of us, and especially me. While stewardship is never a condition for God's acceptance or for our salvation, stewardship is a condition of those who have received God's grace and have been saved by God's grace. Let me repeat that one more time. Stewardship 
is not a condition for God's acceptance and our salvation. But stewardship is a condition of those who have been saved by God's grace. Those who recognize that they could not save themselves on their own, even with the best of their works. And therefore, God had to send his son, Jesus Christ, in our place to live the perfect life, to die the death that we deserve, and to conquer death, the power of sin and death in our lives on our behalf through his resurrection. For everyone who believes that good news of Jesus Christ, the message of grace of God, right, can help but to steward, can, can help but to worship this God who has saved us by grace and, and steward all of our life in response to his grace. And also, utter lack of stewardship, right, in, in one's life can be an indication that that person, right, utter lack of stewardship in, in one's life can be a sign of lack of faith in God. That is possible. So I don't want you to rule that out. Okay. Again, my, my goal here is not to, like, uh, scare you or startle you. But if you happen to be someone who has never received Jesus Christ as your Lord, as the master who owns everything in your life, including your life, both here and in the future, right? I, 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 want, I want to make sure I present this as clearly and as compassionately as I can. If there is absolutely no stewardship in your life taking place right now, I'm not talking about inconsistency and, you know, like, oh, I could do better here, I could do better there. We'll talk about all of that in the coming, coming weeks throughout our series. But I'm talking about if there's no desire and there's no this, like, the, the, the presence of stewardship in your life at all, recognizing that God is the owner of all that you have, then that could be an indication that there, you've never really believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your master. Because that is, that is what it means to receive Christ. You don't just receive Christ and say, hey, uh, Jesus, thank you for what you did for me. And then say, but you don't get to be the Lord of my life. If he's your Savior, he's your Lord. Again, I'm not talking about perfection. You know, we, we could all attest to the fact that we are so inconsistent in honoring Jesus as our Lord. Lord of our time, Lord of our finance, Lord of our you know, tr uh, talents, or whatever it is. So I'm not going to belabor this point, but again, though stewardship is not a condition for our salvation our, or, our, our, or God's acceptance of us as his children, but it is, and it ought to be, an ongoing condition, right, of those who have come to believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And when we, as we see in the, in, the, in, the, in the final outcome of these first two servants who are given five and for, who are given two, right? And they, they, they just rush to the master. They can't wait to see the master. Why? Because they've done all they could in, in managing what the master had given them. And now they, it's like a show and tell time, right? It's not, it's not the dreadful day for them. It's the day that they have been waiting on. They've been like check, you know, crossing out their calendar, <laughs> saying, oh, when is he coming? When is he coming? Oh, he has come. Let me report back to him. Like, whatever you have given me, I've used it for your purpose. And now here. And God doesn't say, okay, thank you. But God, in, in the, here in the story, what does the master do? He says, okay, you've been faithful with little, which wasn't really little, right? It, because it was far more than what they needed, and plus, it was ever more than what they ever deserved in the first place. And God says, okay, you've been faithful with little, so now I'm going to give you more to manage. You see, YOLO is true, as I said at the beginning. You only live once. But that only tells, uh, that, but that, that expression only captures a part of our reality. We will all live for eternity. Life here on earth is not all there is. 
our life compared to eternity with God, uh, participating in God's glorious work of making the whole earth, the new earth, as the Bible calls it, flourish. Right? That day is coming for all of us as long as we have put our trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And stewardship is worship. Yes, certainly there is more to worship than stewardship, but stewardship at the least is worship. In fact, we worship the loudest through our stewardship. You know, don't confuse or don't limit worship as something that we do once a week when we gather together. This is beautiful, and this is special, and God does something amazing through our gather worship. But what do we do with the rest of our life? By well, six days out of the week, We worship the loudest through our, we worship God the loudest through our stewardship every day. So once again, we will get into the how-tos of, like, how, how do we grow as stewards of all that God has given us in the coming weeks, uh, starting next week. We'll, look at, we'll get to the how-to, but today I just wanted to kind of settle the why why this is so important that we understand that God is the owner and we're the manager. And God who owns everything is also uh, who has given us generously and also wisely distributed different amount of blessing according to our ability to handle, right? So that it doesn't become burdensome but become a blessing to us and to others around us. And not only that, our master, Jesus, our Lord, who will one day come, and hold us accountable for the way that we have stored all that he has given us is a Lord who came not to be served, even though he was entitled to be served by his creation, but he came to serve, not to be served, but to serve and to give his own life as a ransom for many so that many more can come to experience what, what Jesus referred to as the abundant life. Life full of joy despite the heartaches and the pain and trouble in this world that only he can give us. Life of love, peace, joy, hope. Right? Our, our master who will one day hold us accountable to the way that we have served him and his purpose is the very one who came to us not to be served, but to serve by giving his own life as a ransom for many. And even though this third servant scenario that in, in the story is disturbing, is harsh, I get that, right? It really just goes against our sentimentality, right? We want to be nice in our culture. We want to tolerate. Like, oh, we don't want to talk about judgment, but even in, his, in, in this harsh picture and, 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 and you know, description of what is to come, underneath that, there is grace. There is this warning to all of us. For those of us who are in danger of not forfeiting our soul, so to speak, because if, if, yeah, once you are saved, you are saved for eternity, Right? You don't lose your salvation. If your salvation is based on what Christ has done, then you can't lose your salvation because you can't undo what Christ has done for you. And you have received that. Then you are forever saved. But you can forfeit this eternal rewards. The rewards that will last for eternity. And again, there might be... Even one person, if there's even a one person who has not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to you know, reach out to me uh, because I, I want to tell you how, how you can receive Jesus Christ as your loving Lord and Savior and live your life as a steward without having to carry the burden of being an owner. No one is fit to be an owner. But we are called to be a steward of all that God has given us. And that's when we can experience the greatest joy, the greatest fulfillment, 
both here and now and later when the day comes. So here, here are two questions that I want to leave you uh, as I close our time. And I want you to really think about this on your own, but also uh, with, with your community group. I, I want to make sure that you, you spend some time just kind of sharing around this, uh, sharing around you know, th- these two questions. First, am I currently living as if God is the owner and I'm the manager of all that God has entrusted to me, including my time, my talent, and my treasure, right? How, where, how much, right? I, I spend and use those things to, that, that God has entrusted me. Look, so am I living as if God is the owner and I'm the manager of all that is God's? So that's the first question. And the second question is this. Am I living each day as if that day of accounting is coming when I will have to give an answer to my Lord for the way that I have used his blessings that he has entrusted to me? Am I living as if that day is coming? Or am I living, am I living as if that day is not coming? And practically, maybe if, if, you're, if you're someone who is kind of living in denial or just, just like dismissing or, or try not to think about the day that is coming your way, maybe it shows up by you delaying certain things that God has revealed to you as his will for you. Right? Maybe there's a, there, there are certain individuals or certain relations that God is saying, hey, pursue. Go approach. Go talk. Go knock. And yet you're delaying. Maybe that's a good sign that, that, that you're living as if that day is not coming. Again, this is, you, you, you are not to be driven by fear or guilt. But rather, it, it, it is best even for you to steward all that God has given you. Because it was for that purpose God has given you. The talent that you have, the time that you have, the resource that you have. However or how little that you might perceive them to be. But, 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 but you have enough and more than enough to do everything that God is prompting you to do on any given moment. So I want you to really wrestle with those two questions this week. Uh, and then, yeah, th- and then share, share with your community group uh, of your own reflection. And then just pray for one another and say, hey, you know, like, God, God, help us uh, to be a better steward, joyful steward of all your blessings. Uh, help us to teach us how to do that uh, uh, so that the day that is coming uh, will be the day of great rejoicing and great reward uh, for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for uh, just th- this, this particular uh, story that Jesus told that is that is recorded in your word and that is passed down to us to remind us of this, uh, this truth about our call to be your steward, that you are the owner. You are the generous, wise uh, owner, humble owner, and we are the stewards. And there is great freedom in knowing that we don't have to, we, ultimately we are not responsible for how things turn out. Like we, we might invest our time and talent and treasure in, in places that you're prompting us to. And yet, maybe there is no fruit that's being shown. Maybe we, some of us have done that and tried that and saw no fruit and we, we, we became discouraged and disillusioned. Or maybe there are people in, in our midst who, who are afraid to jump in with you where you're calling us to jump in by, by, by putting your resource to work to accomplish your purpose in fear that, that it might not turn out in the way that we desire. But Lord, we thank you for this story which reminds us uh, that we, don't, we, we nor anybody else in this world uh, get to evaluate our life, but you alone will evaluate our life. You will tell us whether we have lived a a faithful life of steward with what you have given us, not in comparison to what others have accomplished, but what we have done with what you have given us. And we thank you that that our Lord uh, Jesus 
the one who will hold us accountable for our stewardship of all that we are given uh, by, your, by your grace is the one who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, including many of us in this worship. And so Holy Spirit, in the coming, uh, coming moments and coming days, would you help us to remember that, that we are stewards. We, we are managers and you are the owner. And would you cause us to um, uh, just seek your uh, guidance and seek your uh, will on how and where and how much of all that you have given us, our time, our talent, our treasure, uh, we should spend, Lord, in the coming days uh, for your purpose. Because if we invest for your purpose, uh, that is something that will last forever, for eternity. But whatever we just spend it on ourselves is not necessarily bad because you are generous, <laughs> as we're reminded uh, today. But, Lord, that doesn't last. And so, Lord, just teach us how to worship you uh, through our stewardship in the coming moments and coming days. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
surrender to your name and forever I will pray have your way have your way my whole life is yours I give it all surrender to and forever I will pray have your way have your way let's sing that one more time yes my whole life is yours I give it all surrender to your name and forever I will pray have your way have your way thank you Peter for leading us in that uh, wonderful uh, song of response And church, as we were reminded today, uh, we are created for worship. And we will experience the greatest joy and fulfillment as we worship God. And stewardship is how we get to worship our God the loudest each day. So let's worship God each day this week. by faithfully and joyfully storing all that God has entrusted to us. Now, for those of you who uh, didn't get to join us for our um, game night this past uh, Friday, you, you missed out. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of confusion at first, uh, to be honest. Uh, but it was a lot of fun in the end. And there were two winners uh, uh, of each game, and, and we, we uh, as a church, uh, are going to match the, uh, the collected fees or, or donation uh, that everyone paid as they were participating in that game night uh, this past Friday. And we're going to match, and then we're going to give toward uh, two different organizations. Uh, one is Emily's Place, and then the other one will go to the Network of Ministries. Uh, And so once again, for those of you who were able to join us, uh, I'm glad that we got to not only have a great time of fellowship, but also for a good cause, right? And we get to uh, not just connect with one another over a game, but also we get to bless our neighbors uh, through through our time together. And so I'm I'm very, very thankful uh, that we, even in small ways, we we get to uh, shine the light of Christ. Uh, as, as, as a lighthouse, uh, our, our name. And also, I want to really encourage all of you to continue to uh, just pay attention, to pay close attention to the upcoming opportunities or even ongoing opportunity like, you know, recording books uh, for the children at Emily's Place or uh, Mickey, our brother, who coordinates all our uh, relationship with our local partners in serving our neighbors uh, in need, uh, as he will highlight in the coming weeks, uh, some concrete opportunities. I, I want to really invite you to just prayerfully consider. I know that some of you, uh, depending on the environment in which we get to serve, you might feel unsafe or not yet ready. We understand, but there are other ways uh, that you can serve uh, and steward, right? As we heard today, steward what God has given you uh, for the for for God's purpose, which will last forever. Okay, let's do that. Okay, let me pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you once again for this time of uh, corporate worship. Uh, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would continue to guide and lead and empower us to continue to worship our God, our maker and our lover, uh, through our stewardship of all that you have entrusted to us. But may we not uh, act foolishly uh, as if we are the owner when we are in fact uh, the manager of all that has been entrusted to us for, for your glory, but also for the good of others around us. And may we not also uh, uh, fall into that uh, foolishness 
uh, or, or arrogance of thinking that the day is not coming for us. We live each day uh, remembering that day is coming. We don't know when, but we get to choose how that day will turn out by uh, choosing to yeah, jump in with you where you are at work and where you're inviting us to participate in your work by storing the very resource that you have provided for us so generously and so wisely. So God, help us not to miss out on those opportunities and help us not to um, uh, be, be paralyzed by fear of the what ifs. What if things don't turn out the way we want or we think it should? But rather, Lord, help us to really operate out of faith in you, who is the Lord of all. So, God, we thank you once again for the privilege of participating in your good work through our stewardship. Uh, And, my brothers and sisters, as you go forth from this place to worship God through your stewardship, one interaction, one opportunity, one day at a time, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the infinite love of our Heavenly Father, and the intimate fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore. Amen. Now, for those of you who are uh, available, uh, please uh, join us for our virtual fellowship. Uh, After this worship, just uh, click on that link on the chat box, and uh, I look forward to seeing and catching up with many of you.